The Pope is the main example of virtue for Catholics, but this was not always the case. In this episode of How It Was, we are going to tell you about sinful popes in the history of the Catholic Church. You'll find out which of them arranged the loudest orgies, what is pornocracy, and whether one pope managed to leave a lover for the sake of the church. If you like this video, make sure to click thumbs up. And if you aren't subscribed to our channel yet, now is the time to do just that. Ring the bell and we will pray for your soul so it won't eventually end up among the heroes we are going to tell you about. Let's go. Let's start with the Pope who dug his enemy out of the grave to get his revenge. The 9th century was an extremely unstable time in Europe. The Frankish Carolingian Empire was divided into several parts. Muslims settled in Sicily and southern Italy. Rome was not having a smooth ride either. Not only the Frankish rulers, but also local noble families started competing for influence over the Pope and support of the Church. The Holy See sometimes ended up occupied by aristocrats with dubious morals, but powerful friends. One such example was Stephen VI. He belonged to the noble Frankish family of Widenids and made sure to defend their interests. The Pope was related to the Western emperors Guy and Lambert, with whom Stephen's predecessors had clashed. One of them, Pope Formosus, paid for it after his death. Formosus died in 896 under mysterious circumstances. His successor, Boniface VI, only became the Pope for two weeks before dying as well. Ostensibly, it was from gout, but rumor had it it was Stephen who arranged for his death. In 897, Stephen ordered to dig up Formosus' body, to dress him in papal vestments, and put him on trial by the church. The corpse was accused of violating church rules and oaths, as well as crowning an illegitimate representative of the Carolingian dynasty as Emperor of the West. A priest, hiding behind the throne, answered the questions on behalf of the defendant. For Moses' election as the Pope, all his decisions and actions were declared null and void. Stephen declared curses on the body and cut off the three fingers used to make the sign of the cross. For Moses' naked body was then dragged through the streets and buried in a mass grave. These events were called the Cadaver Synod. The people of Rome were outraged by Stephen's behavior. He was soon deposed from the Holy See and strangled in prison. Two more popes came and went in that same year, 897 alone. Then it got worse. Seven years later, the Catholic Church entered the so-called Dark Age of the Papacy, which has been dubbed pornocracy, meaning rule of the whores in ancient Greek. For 60 years, the Holy See was effectively ruled by two women from the family of the Tusculum Counts, Theodora and her daughter, Marosia. It all started with Pope Sergius III. The first thing he did in his new position was strangle his predecessors, Christopher and Leo V. Sergius spent the time free from politics with the 15-year-old Marosia, at the same time her mother, Theodora, was the official custodian of the papal treasures. The influence of two family prostitutes, Marosia and Theodora, was founded on their wealth and beauty, their political and amorous intrigues. The most strenuous of their lovers were rewarded with the Roman mitre, wrote English 18th century historian Edward Gibbon in his work History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. European chroniclers of that time wrote that a boy was born from the Pope's connection with Marosia. Twenty years after Sergius' death, he would ascend to the Holy See under the name of John XI, thus becoming the only son of a Roman Pope in history who has himself become the Pope. But the rule of the whores would end later. Its last representative is considered to be the grandson of Marosia, Pope John XII. He ascended to the Holy See at the age of 18, so John's reign can hardly be called mature. The dubious achievement is that in the eight years of his reign, he earned the title of one of the most immoral popes in Catholic history. Rumor had it, the young pope turned his residence into a brothel and raped pilgrims in St. Peter's Cathedral. John liked to call out to the pagan gods while playing dice, and at drunken parties he toasted in the name of Satan. Many Romans considered him the devil incarnate. 
According to various sources, he died either from a stroke during sex or after a violent fight with the husband of one of his lovers. For the next 100 years, the pontiffs were alternately appointed by noble Roman families and German emperors. Pope Benedict IX was the son of the Count of Tusculum. He occupied the Holy See three times, at one time actually selling it. At the time of his first election, he was about 20 years old. Unlike many of his predecessors, Benedict did pay attention to church affairs, holding several councils to combat heresy and resolve conflicts between bishops. At the same time, Benedict's cruelty and immorality shocked even the Romans, who were used to everything. He was accused of rape and various forms of sodomy. In 1044, Benedict had to flee Rome. He was driven out by a mob with the support of the Crescenti family, rivals of the Pontiff's family. For a few months, Giovanni de Crescenti became Pope Sylvester III. Benedict soon returned to Rome with an army and reinstated himself on the throne. A month later, however, he sold the title to his godfather, Presbyter Giovanni Graziano, to be able to officially marry his cousin. The marriage did not go well, so Benedict went back to Rome with soldiers demanding to get the Holy See back and capturing part of the city. Sylvester III claimed the title at the same time. As a result, all three popes were withdrawn and Clement II got the coveted position. Two years after Clement's sudden death, Benedict tried to claim his right to the papacy once again, but nobody let him get anywhere near the Holy See. The only three-time pope in history was banned from the church for trading in titles. In the next few centuries, sex scandals became rare in the Catholic Church, and corruption became less visible. During this period, the pontiffs would rather sin with love of power. For instance, Pope Boniface VIII tried to dictate his will to European monarchs, intervened in secular conflicts, and excommunicated opponents. For this, Dante Alighieri placed him in the eighth circle of hell in his Divine Comedy. As for debauchery, it returned to the Vatican during the Renaissance. One of the most striking examples is Pope Alexander VI of the Borgia family. Spaniard Rodrigo Borgia paved the way to the Italian-occupied Holy See through scheming and bribery. Alexander proved to be a skilled diplomat and administrator, unlike many of his predecessors. People of that time said the pontiff attracted women like a magnet and did not even try to hide his affairs with numerous mistresses. Alexander was the father of not only the Catholic Church, but also of at least seven illegitimate children. He supported them with money from the church treasury and placed them in high positions. There was a rumour that the pontiff had a scandalous relationship with his own daughter, Lucrezia. The rumour was started by her husband at the divorce hearing. He claimed that the Pope had taken Lucrezia away from him so that he could sleep with her himself. Wastefulness was another thing that often put Alexander in difficult situations. When the Holy See was on the verge of bankruptcy, the pontiff resorted to unconventional business decisions. He accused local rich people of this or that crime and poisoned cardinals to get their property. Few popes managed to match Alexander VI but corruption and a depraved lifestyle had become commonplace for pontiffs. This was one of the reasons for the birth of the Reformation. In 1517, Martin Luther published his criticism of the Catholic Church. Calls for change in the Church spread across Europe like wildfire. The Catholic Church had to respond, and Pope Paul III initiated the Catholic Revival Movement. His sister, Julia Farnese was the mistress of Alexander VI. She put in a good word for her brother and he became a cardinal. In Rome, he was nicknamed Cardinal Skirt Chaser. At the moment of his election as the Pope, Paul was considered one of the main proponents of strict reforms within the church. At the same time, the pontiff never abandoned his relatives, appointing them for various positions. For example, one of his illegitimate children, and the Pope had at least four of them, was made the Duke of Parma, and two grandsons appointed cardinals. Paul imposed exorbitant taxes on the faithful. If a city refused to pay, he could send an army there. The Pope also imposed taxes on Roman prostitutes. Paul III was a classic example of a Renaissance Pope. On the one hand, his life was a whirlwind of nepotism, intrigue, and a lifestyle that the Church would call immoral. 
On the other hand, he was an art lover and philanthropist. For instance, it was he who commissioned Michelangelo to create the famous Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. Paul's successor, Julius III, was also a fan of Michelangelo's work. The newly elected pontiff initially claimed that he would continue reforms in the church, but his interest in church affairs quickly dried up and the Pope concentrated on more enjoyable pursuits, lavish feasts and young men. Julius III spent a lot of church money to build a luxury villa on the outskirts of Rome. Famous architects, sculptors and artists were commissioned to work for him. The Pope spent most of his time having fun over there, only occasionally going to the Vatican for papal business. Julius III had a favourite companion, a teenager named Innocenzo, whom he picked up on the street. Julius made the young man a cardinal and gave him expensive gifts, including several abbeys. Rumours started about the nature of the Pope's relationship with the boy. This harmed the reputation of the church, which was shaky enough as it was. Julius ignored the cardinals, who implored that he must stop the relationship undermining the church's credibility. It went on until the Pope died. The next Pope, under the name of Paul IV, was Cardinal Carafa, Inquisitor General. He continued the reform of the church initiated by Paul III, but went in an even more conservative direction. Most of all, the pontiff was concerned about the moral image of the church. It was from that moment on that popes actually started adhering to the lifestyle they preached. Which of these popes would you call the biggest sinner? Or was it somebody else? Tell us in the comments section. And don't forget to give us a thumbs up, ring the bell, and be the first to get notified about our latest videos.